Hospitality professionals rely on HD supply facilities and maintenance for the day-to-day maintenance of their engineering departments, housekeeping supplies, as well as their capital expenditure renovations. And why? Because they're reliable and they've been around for decades. They have over 100,000 products and they have a nationwide distribution system. They have an amazing dedicated sales representation force and they have the tools, technology, and specialized services to make your hotel spectacular. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn, teaching you to be the hotel you're that you wanna be. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn. All right. Let's, let's go in three, two, one, go! All right, that's what I like. Hey, welcome to Check It In with Anthony and Glenn. I'm Glenn. I'm Anthony. And we got a great guest today, Jay Stein, CEO of Dream Hotel Group. Let's hear it for him. We are, we are coming at you from a live event here in New York City at the Time Hotel. What a coincidence that we got the Time Hotel and the CEO of the company that operates the Time Hotel here. I want to, before we start, I would like very much to thank our sponsors for the evening. Sojourn, Navis, Rate Gain, SkyTouch, G-Commerce, and SHR. It's here for those great sponsors. Yeah. All right, so Jay, it's so exciting to have you here tonight. Well, first I want to welcome everybody to the Time Hotel. It's actually uh, nice to be in my own house. Uh, this was our first lifestyle hotel, and for those who don't know, Dream Hotel Group. We started uh, doing lifestyle hotels in 1997 when we started designing this property. It was originally a Clarion Hotel, believe no it or not. It was. <laughs> and the only lifestyle hotels in the world really were Ian's, and uh, uh, Bill Kempton had a few on the West Coast, but nothing like what Ian Schrager was doing here in New York. I loved what Ian was doing. I thought it was amazing. Uh, we wanted to replicate some of those elements and then bring a very sophisticated hospitality edge, which I don't think was Ian's forte at that point. It was more of a bit of a loof kind of uh, atmosphere for any of you that tried to get in a, into one of Ian's hotels back in uh, the mid 80s and early 90s, unless you really fit that look, you weren't getting in. Yeah, it'd be really uh, pretty. <laughs> So we tried to... That, that explains why I had to sleep on the street outside of those hotels. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so this was the first one we did, and uh, we opened up in 1999, and uh, ever since then, we've been a lifestyle hotel company. As you know, everybody now is a lifestyle hotel company, uh, though we've been involved in this uh, from, uh, well, almost 20 years ago now. So uh, we, we, we think we are truly one of the real... So I have a, I have a question for you. Um, we know each other how long now? Uh, even longer than that, so probably 25 years, maybe? 25 years. So how did you guys meet? <laughs> okay, that's a good... That is a great <laughs> setup. Thank you so that's much. That's a great setup. I actually applied for a position with my friend, <laughs> and he had an office. What hotel, what hotel was it back 25 years ago? Is that the president? The, probably the president. I walk into his office, and his office, I just remember being very small, and it just... I was, I'm claustrophobic, so I was a little claustrophobic. I sit down, and all I can remember about that is two things. He was the nicest person in the world. And I was like, I want to work for this guy. And we got along really well, but I didn't get the job. <laughs> so I want to know right here, right now, why didn't I get the job? You know, I, 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 don't, I don't screw up too often, but every once in a while I do. <laughs> no, funny. No, you mean dodge a bullet. <laughs> I, I was going to say, uh, as, as your co-host of the series, I know exactly why you didn't no, get the job. One of the, <laughs> and one of the things that's always impressed me is, you know, in this industry, it's a very difficult industry to really get to the top without burning bridges. And I will tell you that you're the only person I know in this industry that's got to the tippy top of the industry. And there's not one person I've ever met that doesn't say anything great about you. So I missed an opportunity to work for really one of the best people in the uh, industry. I'm just glad we kind of both kind of met, at, you know, met. So after 25 years, and we're still friends. So I don't know why you didn't give me the job, but you know, I'm still it's still bothering me. Well, well, you know, early on in my my career, and I had a lot of employees, a lot of. Uh, mid and, and low skilled employees in the early days going up through food and beverage. Sounds and perfect for <laughs> <laughs> That was a little later on. And, and you know, and I had to do some, you know, a lot of hires and some firings and some disciplinary stuff. And, uh, 
and you know, you're learning yourself as you're going through it. You don't, you know, there's no real textbook that teaches you all this. And I know I, I one time uh, did a termination, and I got frustrated, you know, talking to the employee, and at the end, he left, and I sat there, and I knew I was not being fair. And it, it just ate me up inside that I was not, you know, being fair with an employee, and I just kind of looked in the mirror and said, you know, who the hell do you think you are? You know, how are you ever going to be a, a, a great leader and not... You know, so I, I felt terrible, and I learned so much from that experience um, that you need to look at both sides, listen to both sides, and give the benefit of the doubt, and um, just learned a lot. That, that's a big thing of what I do is, is psychological, is understanding employees and trying to build great teams. Every once in a while, I miss hiring great employees, but um, I try to surround myself with, with, with great talent and, and also difficult talent. Uh, I, I'm then not you should afraid. Hire me. Then you should hire me. <laughs> exactly. I'm not afraid to hire people that are a pain in the ass, that are hard to manage. And Katie, and, and a number of other people here will, will tell you that. So we, does that, that we, mean, uh, Katie, <laughs> So that means uh, so Katie, Katie, no, Katie's not one of those. So you're horrible to no. manage. Is that, that <laughs> Katie's a sweetheart. She's shaking her head. No, no, no. And, I think, and I think that's a really, really good point that a lot of people are afraid to to be challenged and be told. You know, I always say. Don't, if we're in a meeting, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to go after me. But after the meeting, close the door, and you can tell me anything you want. You can use foul language. You can, just don't throw anything and don't hit me. Well, but you get, like, you don't get anywhere when you just have your own point of view. Because, you know, I get sick and tired of listening to myself and hearing myself. So if I can hear, listen to a housekeeper, front desk person, whether it be PR, uh, whether it be marketing, I always want to hear different people. I had a similar experience. I think I was at the Plaza Hotel, and I, I terminated this gentleman, and I was maybe 26, 27. He's got in the military. And in the military, you know, you listen to your boss. I was the boss. He didn't listen to me. I fired him. And I was very insecure, and I, I was probably really rude. And I remember he went, to the, he went down, he got changed. He comes back up, and, he's, and he, I'm at the front desk, and I'll never forget it. He opens up the door, and he's in the door frame, and he looks at me, and he said, you can fire me, but you can't take my spirit. You stole wow. my spirit, and you're not allowed to do that. So I had the similar, the similar feeling. I went in the corner. I probably cried a little bit and said, what an asshole. Like, why would I do that to somebody? Why would I feel that I'm so much more important? I grew up on welfare, food stamps. Why do I think I'm that much better? Because I'm the, the front office manager at the Plaza Hotel. Yeah. Who the heck am I? So that was the moment I was humbled, and I was like, all right, I got this. I'm not that important. I'm the least important person in the building. So how do you guys then uh, act as good managers that really tell people, hey, you can challenge me as long as you do it in the right way? Because I think from my, a lot of years when I was somebody's employees, they would say that, but a lot of times it just felt like lip service. Yeah, your door's open, but it doesn't really mean I could come in. No, uh, my door is open, and I think that I have a lot of employees that are here right now, and I think they will tell you that if they send me an email or if they uh, you know, send me a phone call, whatever it may be, uh, I will get back to you, and I'll get back to you pretty quickly. It may be a day, it may be two, I would say three at the most, and if you've got something on your mind, um, whatever it is, and as Anthony says, it's gotta be the right place to do it. So come in, close the door, and then it's free. Any, anything you wanna say, any way you wanna say it, uh, that's fine. And um, I, I think you're right when you say, just because you say you have an open door policy, do you really have it and do you foster it so that people take advantage of right. it? Right. So uh, uh, let me flip that then, Anthony, and ask you this, this question. Um, how do you actually do that, internalize it? Because you may think you have that open door policy, but you don't really. It's funny. I have an open door policy, but my door's closed. Right. <laughs> no, literally. I have, any office I've ever worked in, my door's closed because I need time to think. And most of the time I'm on the floor, I'm running around, so my door's closed. I like having my own little isolation, but they know they can knock on it. And so basically you have to have those moments. I always talk about in life there's moments. So there was one time, um, I think maybe you guys discussed it once on one of our podcasts, where there was a director of marketing that was challenging me in a room. And I remember it was a long table and there was like 14 people in the room. They were all executives. I was the VP. And she was just going after me. And she didn't mind grabbing me by the throat and throwing me against the wall. And I remember I was being respectful, but I was pretty intense. 
And we're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. She's at the end of the table. I'm at the end of the table. Everybody's looking. They're like, I know internally they're saying, this is great. So, so she's talking. I'm talking. And I am 100% positive I am right and she is wrong. And then she said something. I was like, oh, crap. She's right. I am so wrong. And I'm like, how do we get out of this room? And I said, I said two words. I'm sorry. That was it. I said, I'm sorry. And then I started to explain to her, you're right, I'm wrong. You know what she kept on doing? Arguing with me. I go, you won. I'm wrong, you're right. I, you won. Stop arguing with me because now you're really irritating me. It's like, I'm wrong. I, she goes, no, you're just saying that just to, make, to, to just end it and you don't really mean it. I said, from the bottom of my soul, I was wrong, you were right. And I re regurgitated the answer of what, what she changed my mind on. I can't remember what it was. I said, that was a brilliant argument. You're right. I wasn't looking at it that way. I'm sorry. And so to your point was, everybody else in the room saw I walked my walk. I walked the talk that I was talking about. I said, I'm sorry, and you can challenge me. I didn't get mad at her. Matter of fact, later on, we had a private meeting. I gave her a hug, and I said, thank you. Thanks for holding me accountable. And more importantly, thank you for giving me the ability to teach a lesson to everybody in the room that we are all in charge. You know, if I'm the smartest guy in the room, you better leave the room. So, Jay, how do you put ego aside to make sure everybody's doing their best and you can be successful? Because I've been watching Dream Hotel Group over the last few years, and since you've become CEO, I feel like there's been a marked difference. You're expanding. You've got these great new projects. And everybody I meet, I was telling people earlier, I happen to love everyone who works for your company. <laughs> but if I can interrupt real quick, you know how yeah. he does it? Every night, about 11 o'clock, he calls me and goes, Anthony, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I won't do that then. <laughs> no, so th that's the hard part. You know, I see myself kind of like a, a puppeteer in some right. ways. And I was saying that I, that I don't mind hiring uh, difficult people to manage, not just for the sake of challenging me, but for people that have things to offer. You know, people that are challenging because they're creative, because they're uh, strong-willed, and they're passionate. And a lot of times people don't want to manage those kinds of people because they're hard to manage. Uh, and I learned early on that you get a lot from those people. Those are the ones that get you the reviews. Those are the ones that come up with food presentations from chefs that are a pain in the ass or say, look, I've got to have black plates because it's going to make my food pop. And I said, I just spent, you know, $4,000 on white plates. And, what, and, I, and I would just learn some, sometimes you got to give in and give some people, you know, their space. Let them be creative. Let them get the limelight. Let them, you know, do what they do. And, and hopefully get, reap some of those rewards. But, and not everybody's that way. Other people are much more pass, you know, passive. And so, but I want to bring them in, too. I don't want them just to be overshadowed by these strong people. So I've got to be that protector. I've got mm -hmm. to be because I have enough cloud in the room to, right. to make the shots and then try and build a team where there's really great dynamics mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully doing great stuff do, together. Do you think you're a musician, right? I am. You're in a band. I am. Do you think that helps you? You know, it helps me uh, stuff like this because when I started doing a lot more public speaking and uh, so I, I go on stage usually three, four times a month and, it, and you, you get nervous. You get nervous energy and I played in front of big crowds and now I speak in front of... Uh, we were just in the lodging conference uh, yep. the last week. I was actually week, I was going to try to segue into the lodging conference by saying, did you play in the band on the I did, last night? I did. It was about 1,000, maybe 1,500 people there that I played in front of. And uh, So yeah, it's just kind of a good, you know, to take that nervous energy that you have and then harness that into uh, energy instead of just making mistakes by having the nervous energy. You know, you have to prep. You've got to be prepared. You've got to know your stuff. And then when you get up there and, and there's nerves and it's, it's creating this energy, is then use that energy as power and, and hopefully the things that you're solid at will even be stronger, uh, more gregarious and you know, more engaging. And so, yeah. You, you said all the things, the reason I asked that, you said all the things as far as bring them in. Give them the spotlight. All the things a musician would say. Like, let you know, a difficult person. It's okay, but they're going to be in the front of the stage and they're going to rock it and you're going to sit there and you're going to support them, but then you're going to go in front of the stage. So to me, that, it blends well into what we do in this industry. And those more passive people that, you know, may not be the gregarious ones or getting on the podcast or whatever, they know that the work that they are putting in is so important because they're hearing it in our own internal meetings and knowing that, you know, they might not be the flashy one, but their work is so valuable and these passionate people are coming to them because they need them. They need them to do the other work and to, and to execute some of their vision. And so everybody feels when they 
get a great cover right. story about Dream Hollywood or about a great hotel or a signing that got done, that they know they were part of it. Uh, so, and it wasn't just me, and it wasn't just mm -hmm. the, the loud mouths, but, you know, but they were all part of this team, and, and the results we're getting. So what advice would you give? That's a good point, because I've, saw, I've seen people in this industry who are amazing workers, and they clock in, they clock out, and they are superstars. But they don't, they're, they're not out there. They don't want the fanfare. They don't want, you just pay them well, pat them on the back. How do you get those people out front? How do you get those people to kind of advertise for themselves without getting their ego involved? You know, but I, but, and we've had a bunch of them, you know, where, where the first three months, you know, I hardly hear a word out of them. That's like, a, there's a mouse, you know, they don't, they don't say anything. But over time, as we create more of a, a, an atmosphere within the company, that people feel comfortable and they go to a, a drink with the group afterwards or we do something up on our rooftop and, and all of a sudden you see them start to come alive and become part of the team and I've seen people that look like they were never going to break that kind of mold that they were in actually change. And everybody, you know, wants to be part of something. Uh, and they don't all have to, you know, be out front and be uh, loud and gregarious. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my revenue people, you know, I want them to be analytical. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, they come to the table and they come up with ideas and, you know, there are the Oscar people going, oh, my God, that's brilliant. You know, look at the results that we got. And now all of a sudden these guys are superstars. Hmm. They're quiet, but they're superstars and they're valued in these meetings. We do a meeting every Tuesday morning, about 20 people around the table. And, uh, you know, everybody contributes. There's no one, in, you know, they're all VPs and everyone there has an important job to do. Some are loud and noisy and, and some are very quiet. But uh, none of them are not important, and they all feel important. So uh, how do you adapt your management style to deal with that person that doesn't want to be managed or that person that needs that hyper management and attention? That's what I do. I mean, that, that's, that's what I learned, on, learned early, early on in my career is, you know, everybody's different. Uh, you know, sometimes I'd call an employee and say, man, you're late every day. You know, I, I, I will have to fire you. You can't be late because if I let you, because I love you and I think you're great, but if I let you be late and then I hassle someone else for being late, then I'm playing favorites and I, and I don't want to lose you. So, you know, you got to, you know, you just got to be here on time. And how do I get it through to you? Now, no, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then two days later, you're late. late and you fire him. No, and then, <laughs> so then I come in and I bring them an alarm clock in a, in a box and say, here's a present for you. Right. And I look at them in the eye and I say, you know I'm serious now, right? You know, I do not want to get to that next meeting that we're going to have. And, you know, I just try to, and, and if we have to, I fire them. I've, I've fired friends of mine oh, in, in the industry. That's painful. And then got invited to their weddings two months later. Right. And uh, because they just knew that, you know. Because you're a gentleman and people <laughs> see your passion. My, my tagline is passion changes everything. And it's true. If you're passionate, people will forgive you if you do the right thing, right? Right. Because even though they don't have to forgive you because you did the right thing, in their mind they're like, I kind of deserve that. And well, I would say if you're firing somebody and they come in the office and they don't know they're getting terminated, you screwed up. Right. right. 100%. <laughs> so they should come in and go, I know, I know, I'm right. gone, I'm gone, I'm gone. Yeah. Thank and you. You were very nice. I'm out of here. Thank and, to, and to your point before, I'd rather pull people back than push people forward. I have never ever been able to get somebody that doesn't really love hospitality and push them forward to learn to love hospitality. I've had plenty of people where I've had to kind of harness and go, dude, just relax. We'll get to everything. We'll change everything in the hotel. We'll do everything that we said we we're going to do, but you can't kill everybody in the hotel. You got to relax. Those people, those people, actually that was me in the beginning. That's why they didn't hire me. But those people, I love those people because those people are easy. Just wrestle them to the ground and say, relax. But the other people that you're trying to say, hey, let's step up. Let's move. Wake up on time. If you have to tell me to wake up on time and, and show up, I mean, that's the, you know, my friend Mark Summers says, you know, um, early is on time, on time is late, and late it's unacceptable. And I guess as we get older, we really realize that. You know, when I was going to be late for this, I thought I was going to be late because of the traffic. I was having a heart attack. Right. You know? See, and I, I joke do have a half hour cushion. And I yeah. still was having a heart attack. Well, so I work for an uh, Indian from India company. And Indians are historically known for being late and starting functions late. And, uh, and it drove me crazy, you know, the first few years. And then I got to the point where I'd say, does anyone know what time the 4 o'clock meeting is, gonna, is supposed to start? <laughs> <laughs> 5.30. Yeah. yeah, but once you say 5.30, it starts at 6.30. <laughs> so uh, I think that's a really interesting thing, Anthony, that you point out there, Jay. Do you, do you ever have people that are so enthusiastic that you do have to reel them back in and make them feel comfortable 
but a little bit lower, tamped down. Yeah, it definitely goes both ways. I mean, you know, every, it's, 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 it's got to be a team. It's got to be dynamic. If one person is just, you know, sticking out and, and breaking the, the cohesiveness mm -hmm. uh, or the picture, you know, I always look at Disney and, you know, you know they, they create an entire, like, movie each day, mm -hmm. you know, and it's choreographed. And, and that's what I try and back when I was managing properties to, to tell my team, you know, that's what we need to do. And, when, and once you want to go and be with your tie down or use the wrong language, that's fine, but do it back of the house. You know, once you go front of the house, we are we are performers out there. You know, and everyone needs to be part of that show. Right. And so, if they bought into it, great. If they didn't, they had a hard time with me. So in going from um, that guy's having a hard time getting in touch with you. He just keeps calling. Uh, <laughs> San Francisco. I okay. Who knows? Okay. Let me shut up. Um, so in seeing meeting you 25 years ago, when we were both really young. Um, we're still kind of young. I'm not what young. Is, and going to where you are now and being in charge of one of the greatest companies and great hotels and doing all you do, you're doing. And you know, people talk about millennials and they talk about that. Like, what? So like, how do you how do you uh, manage millennials and how do you manage people that aren't, you know, uh, great? And how do you like all the things you're talking about? I don't care about any of that. I want to know what is the code. What is the thing, the one thing that no matter where you were, what position, who you were dealing with, what's the one thing that keeps you on point? Because a lot of people blow their careers up. Hmm. I came very close to blowing my career up a couple times. What do you, There's what, still what, time, don't what, worry. What, <laughs> what, keeps, what keeps you kind of humbled and just patient? You know, I, to me, work, I'm very passionate about it. I put a lot of time and a lot of energy, but it was never more than you know, something that I was doing, it wasn't life or death. You know, it wasn't worth getting crazy over to where I would be sick. It wasn't worth, uh, you know, getting such stress that I, I would, you know, have panic or something. And, and, and sometimes I'd get close to that and then it would just flash and go, wait a second, I, I'm just running a hotel. I'm just working for another company. You know, it's just not worth it. Life is too short to get that crazy about anything, unless it's, you know, your family and somebody's sick or something. You know, that you can get crazy about. And, and, and as I got older, that got even more embedded into me, so it got really hard for me to ever get nuts and, and crazy. And, and then, you know, you, you know, you see the Me Too movement now, and you think about how you could screw up your career. And, um, and, and I realized this, you know, 25 years ago. You know, being a GM or, or just being department head and having, you know, 30, 40, 80, 200 employees working with you and going out, you know, for a drink after work and not being married. And, you know, our industry is just so susceptible to, to that kind of stuff where you could just make a mistake and all right. of a sudden, and even back then. So I became very clear that, you know, you cannot do things that were not appropriate. And in the workplace. And I would yeah, always say, important. you know, don't shit where you work, you know. Right. And I would tell employees when they would get drunk. or And I always have a rule. You do not go to the bars in the hotel that we have. Mm -hmm. You know, there's 10,000 other bars. Go there. <laughs> you know, you don't have to go where you work. And so, you know, when I see the Me Too now, and I, I you know, we, again, it was something that has been part of me for a very long time. Uh, and being very careful of how you touch somebody and how you approach somebody and uh, what's, what's said at a Christmas party and, and all this other kind of stuff. And it's funny now how it's become, uh, you know, a major, major issue. But, but it's then, interesting so, to me, Jay, that you saw that and yeah. recognized that yeah, when yeah. culturally society wasn't in that place. And still not. We were in the lodging last week and yeah. I was with David Cooperberg and this guy in the industry comes over and he said two things so unbelievably inappropriate. You know, saying it was just good. But I don't even know the guy, and David didn't either. And, you know, to just, like, say that at, at, so, a, at a so, party, I was like, wow. So that's, you know, <laughs> I don't think, I think it's about self-discipline, and I think it's about how you were raised. I don't right. think it's about don't do anything inappropriate at a party. You know what? I won't do anything inappropriate at a party. <laughs> I'm smart enough not to get drunk if I'm, like, the manager and my boss is there. I'm, I, I don't think anybody's got to tell me that. You know, if I'm going to get on stage or I'm going to do a TV show, no one's got to tell me not to drink too much before a camera's in my face. Or if somebody doesn't have to say to me, you know, if I'm sitting at the bar, well, don't touch a woman inappropriately. You don't have to tell me that. You, you should you know, have told me all like, this stuff before tonight. No, I mean, no, I'm so I just think, I personally think, if you're an idiot, you're an idiot. 
And if you don't know how to behave in society, right. you know, anything I try to train you or put you in a manual and say, hey, don't do this, don't do If I have to tell you not to touch a woman inappropriately, you know, you're an idiot. Right. And I say that all of the time. And I got to say, one of the things I love about podcasts is we have not discussed one issue that we thought we were going to discuss yeah. today. This uh, is so much. And the VP of communications going, wrap it up. We'll just talk about sexual harassment for another two hours. Is that okay? Uh, uh, Katie, she's shaking her head. She's freaking out. So I do want to talk about uh, Dream Hotel Group. You know, you're here. We've got you here. What are some of the big issues that you're thinking about when it comes to building the perfect hospitality experience? Yeah, so we're, we're growing, we're looking at, um, you know, a lot of people copy a lot of the stuff that, that we were doing a number of years ago that right. people said, wow, that's great, and they've got such great success in their food and beverage. Um, but, but, you know, hotels are a place for people to sleep, a place for people to eat, drink, socialize, and, you know, we're not, you know, uh, curing cancer here. Right. You know, so uh, I think as we add in different amenities, as we try to build different food and beverage and health and wellness venues, keep them current, um, and, and hire people on our teams or hire outside companies, designers, and um, to help us figure out what is the right programming, what is the right activation, what are some of the, you know, uh, there's so much going on with marketing now. In the old days, we had directors of sales and marketing, and, and now we really only have directors of sales and directors of marketing. And it's a whole new world out there of, of how we try to market our hotels um, and, and get to that core guest in a meaningful way. Uh, and, and Katie's, you know, our PR person, and uh, PR is such an important part of what we do. You know, we, we were just at the New York Times on Sunday in the travel Woo! section. Congratulations. For the, for the unscripted hotel, had a huge picture. This is a 76-room hotel in downtown Durham. It's been in the New York Times three times what? in the first year that it's been open. With a picture yeah, this big. That's amazing. And, um, so, the, and we, so we try and get the, the, good, the good things you can get PR if you're building hotels that are stories to tell about them. Mm -hmm. You know, if you put up a Hilton Garden Inn in the same location, nothing wrong with Hilton Garden Inn, but it's probably not going to be able to get the message out and get the story out. So fortunately, we do these kinds of hotels. We have these think tanks of what would be fun, what would be different. You know, I used the example in Dream Downtown this year for Valentine's Day. We had a couple of our geniuses trying to think of, you know, a fun thing to do. So this guy, James Gold Crown, does uh, this graffiti art. and There are all these shapes of hearts and he spray paints them on these huge walls and they're kind of dripping and he, he's done thousands of them. And we did one for us in South Beach and then this year we asked him to do it on Valentine's Day live, this huge wall in, in the lobby and do this painting throughout the whole day. And while he's doing it, we hired a tattoo artist to take his same little hearts and do free tattoos for anybody that want, wanted one in wow. the lobby. Real tattoos? On, real tattoos. And our, our legal, our in-house counsel was like, wait, wait, I don't know if we could do <laughs> tattoos. I'm sure. And, and she researched, she said, you know what, we're cool, we can do it. And, uh, so how many, how many tattoos I think we did about day? 50, 50, 60. 50 tattoos? A line around the block for free heart tattoos. Well, we had two million, I don't know how many millions of hits we had, but it just got picked up and it went super. And it cost us, you know, a couple of thousand dollars. And we've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of value. Um, so, and I know in the old days we used to buy t the New York Times Time. Friday section, right, to buy uh, ads, and there was sixty thousand dollars for half right, a page, right, right. hundred thousand right. dollars for a full page, and we would consider how much revenue we're we getting back from these. And obviously, you no one does that anymore. But you know, when, so when you can think of how can you get your name, how can you get your message out there in creative ways, and look, it doesn't work every time, right. believe me. But that those are the kinds of but things. But if you're like thinking about it, we were talking about this the other day. If you're thinking about it on a daily basis, PR used to be an event, right? It used to be like, you know, we we're talking about Valentine's Day. But it's every day you're thinking about it. Every day, how do you get everybody to be a PR person for you? And that's really kind of how I, if you ask me, how I made my bones in this industry, PR. You know, what's the biggest PR thing I've ever done was. I created a show and they're like, hey, I don't have a million dollars to market myself, so let me do a TV show. And then we did a $10,000 martini at the Algonquin. I'm always thinking about PR. Oh, and you have to get the housekeeper, you have to get the front desk. <clears throat> always think about PR, because really today, it's in your hands. It's no longer where the New York Times will maybe give you a section for 20 grand. Wow, it's interesting that you, you say this and you both put such a high emphasis on, on PR, because 
what I've seen is a lot of the major companies have started to roll back on PR. They don't necessarily understand the value of PR, and I think it's indispensable. I just don't think they have a story that people care about. So, you know, how much money are you going to spend on something that, you know, yeah, it'll get you, uh, you know, some stories, but you're paying tons of money, and the return is not there. So that's right. why they don't care. Mm -hmm. um, you look at the return that we're getting, you know, on the amount of, it's tremendous. So of course we care about it. Right. If you look at this little hotel, and I said it started in 1999, you figured, it, you know, could it still be the same name, still be cool, or a lifestyle hotel? It'd be very difficult to do. Now we did a great renovation about less than two years ago, uh, but the team and some of them are here. Is cover still here? Um, you know, so th these these guys are thinking all the day, all day long of, of how to market the hotel, of bringing in uh, influencers and doing blogs. And you see tonight in this tiny hotel with hardly any meeting space, there's four events going on, right? Five events going on. Um, and, and you know, so that's you're trying to stay relevant. Yeah. You're trying. You're one of the events. We're glad to have you. But that's uh, kind of stuff we do. Yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty awesome. So I think we got to wrap this part. Yeah, of the I got to run. I got to got You've got a dinner. But what we're going to do is I think what we should do is maybe um, have you folks out in our great live audience ask uh, Anthony and myself some questions. And I know you, it's really asking Anthony questions. I'm just going to sit here and try to be pretty. Um, so uh, let's hear it for uh, Mr. Jay Stein. <laughs> Man, thank always you, a thank pleasure. you so much. Great to see you. Let's grab a picture. Yeah. All right, we're going to grab a picture real quick. Now, quick. if anybody has a question for me before I leave, I'm happy to Anyone? entertain anything. Smile over your right. head. Glad <laughs> you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Katie. Awesome. Not for me. Okay, great. Thank you for coming to the Time Hotel. We really appreciate it. Great. Anthony, Glenn, thanks great. so much for having me. It was awesome having you. And thanks for being such a great host. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Uh, anyone's got any great questions for uh, Anthony or uh, myself, which I know you don't really have any for? Anyone? Anyone? Uh, you guys can't be this quiet. Anthony, what's the favorite? All right, hold on. Let me bring out. Let me bring you. Let me bring you the microphone so we can get it on uh, on record. What's been your favorite hotel you've had to work at? Favorite hotel I've ever worked at. Hold on one second. And I'm trying to get my my Instagram story going. Hold on a second. I'm not the best at this. Top left. <laughs> um, yeah, just do that. And, um, the favorite hotel I've ever worked at. Um, okay, from a building standpoint, the Plaza Hotel. When I left that hotel, it was like leaving like my first girlfriend. It was like, oh, don't leave me. I felt desperate. Literally, the building was like like a girlfriend to me. And then. I'd say from an emotional standpoint, from a team standpoint, from, oh my God, what we built was the Algonquin. When I left that hotel, the Algonquin Hotel on 44th Street, because we took a hotel that really hadn't done anything in 30 years, and we turned it around, and everybody knew about it. And to get the union and the management to work together, and we were all celebrating, we all loved each other, you don't see that in New York very often, because you're usually at odds. So that, to me, was, I walk into that hotel every day, you know, every time I'm in New York City, just to feel, you know, to feel that family atmosphere. And we, we all hug and we kiss and we cry. So I'd say from a building standpoint, the plaza, and from an emotional team building standpoint, I'd say the uh, Algonquin, but the Lucerne Hotel on the Upper West Side was my first kiss. I was a general manager there uh, at 29 years old, and I was there seven years. So that's another great hotel. Great. Awesome. I, I love it. I'm going to bring the microphone down over here, all right, Chris Jackson, G Commerce. Anthony, what do you think uh, is the biggest challenge that our industry faces currently, or the biggest challenge that maybe we're not even aware of that's coming in the very near future that we've got to overcome? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I think the biggest challenge that we face is that we're always worried about the biggest challenge we're facing. <laughs> Okay, instead of worrying about the housekeeper and the front desk clerk and make sure the uniforms are clean and the windows are clean and your Instagram stories look good and everything that's important to the customer, because I don't, I, or the guests, I don't, I don't look at us as, as hotels. I look at us as, as a home. Like, how many people have gone to a hotel and as soon as you lock that door, double lock it, you're like, ugh. Oh. Right? And plus, now your wife's not there, your kid's not there, and you actually get to now enjoy the room, watch TV, watch whatever you want to watch, and relax and get that hamburger when nobody's watching or that extra beer, and really just decompress. So what I always say is stop worrying about, like, I'm paranoid about what my competition's doing, and I am paranoid about what's coming down the pike because I don't want to be part of business. But I'm just as paranoid as that housekeeper upset, is that housekeeper got her uniform on right? Uh, all the little things, because all the little things are the big things. 
So when people say millennials, if somebody says millennials to me one more time, I'm gonna, my head's going to explode. What's the difference between me? I, I got to see this. Millennials, millennials, what, millennials. What's the, di what's, what's the difference between a 50-year-old that's traveling today and a millennial that's traveling today? We all want internet connection. We all want good food. We all want experience. We all want good service. We all want a good bed. I don't know what a millennial wants and what I want that's different. I don't. Maybe if they're working for me, maybe there's a little bit of difference. But when you come into a hotel, I want to be, have an experience when I want one, and I want to be left alone when I want one. Right. I think that's one of the major misconceptions that we have. We, we, we separate all the generations like they want different things, and we, we tend to try to treat them differently. But at the end of the day, everyone wants a clean, comfortable room and to be recognized and feel good about and, and themselves. Right. They want to feel special. Everybody right. wants to feel special, right? And, you know, I was just at a, a really nice five-star hotel, and they gave me a really big bowl of fruit, right? And I'm there for like, you know, I don't know, eight hours. What am I going to do with a two-and-a-half-pound bowl of fruit? Right now, if you slice it up for me and give me a little chocolate, I'm gonna eat that whole thing. But if you give me like 27 bananas and 27 apples, like maybe I'll have one banana, right? And then, you know, and when we, I'm not peeling an apple, I'm not cutting an apple. Like, I just like slice it for, like, think like everybody basically wants the same thing. And what we want is we wanna feel comfortable, we wanna feel important, and we wanna feel that somebody's paying attention to us. And it's pretty simple. Now, you go to a hotel, you want to feel, you know, like it's cool or whatever. That, you know, that's personal preference. But at the end of the day, when it's funneled down, you know, Maslow hierarchy of needs, the first three needs are basic. I want food, shelter. You know, I want to be loved. It said one of his things is, you know, I always say, you know, one of his needs are sex. Well, you bring your own sex, but we make you feel comfortable. We, we, we feed you. It's simple. And I'm so kind of I think you just thought of the next great hotel concept. But I'm, t I'm sick and tired of people obsessing about millennials and what they want. It's like, it's what we all want. Just like we want to feel comfortable and taken care of. Right, great. Uh, Jeff, you got a question? Yeah, Anthony, thank you. Uh, a pretty broad question here, but looking at the U.S. hospitality market as a whole, is there one hotel group, one independent, one branded, one leader like Jay that you think is absolutely doing it right, doing it best right now? Jerry from Forbes Travel, who just left. Everybody know Jerry and Zarello from Forbes Travel? Here, he, unfortunately, he left and he's now working uh, in Saudi Arabia. But he was the president, he's co chairman still of, of Forbes Travel Guide. And I think that he said something really important. I was just out in Beverly Hills a couple months ago at this black tie fair with him, and he said, We're servants. That's it. Done. If you don't get that, don't be in this business, right? So, who's ever doing it and understands that I'm a servant, that's what I do. I'm not there for any other reason. I'm not there to wear a fancy suit and make a lot of money. I'm there to serve my employees, not my guests, my employees. If I don't see a guest for a month, I don't care. I can care less. I, when I am obsessed if my employees don't have what they need. Because once they have what they need, once they feel empowered, okay, then there's no excuses. I, I take all the excuses away, and I give you what you need, and that's my job. And then my job is, as Jay said, if you don't do it, I buy your alarm clock. I'll buy you two alarm clocks, but at the end of the day, you know, if I'm helping you, you got to help me. So I think Jerry really says that well, but um, I think there's a lot of great hoteliers out there, and we just met a couple, uh, the gentleman down in the Four Seasons and the gentleman out at Garden City, um, Grady, and they're all, I think they're all, if you've lasted in this industry for as long as we have, as long as Jay has, as long as Grady has, and, and you've lasted being a general manager for 18, 20 years, you have to get it. Because you will be blown out, you will be, people will find out you're a fraud. So, and so the takeaway here, which is true of leadership in any industry. Right. The, the takeaway of leadership in any yeah. industry? The, the, the takeaway here with leadership in any is humility. Remove the ego and be a humble servant. Everything I've right. learned, I learned in kindergarten. Help people cross the street, open the door, say please and thank you. You know, don't take anything that's not yours. When you go to somebody's house, don't open the medicine chest. It's like, just be human. And I don't think it's that hard. Now, on the other hand, it's like, I will hold you accountable. I'm a pretty intense guy. I'll hold you accountable, but I don't have to be mean to do that. You know, one of my taglines, be nice, just be nice. Like uh, uh, Eleven Madison and Nomad, their, 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 their restaurant group, their tagline is, make it nice. My tagline is, be nice, right. just be nice. But be nice doesn't mean be weak, and be nice doesn't mean be a pushover. Be nice is be respectful. 
right? And I don't think people understand that all the time. Well, we did a whole show on Be Nice, so I encourage everybody, if you're listening to this online or here in the room, download Checking In with Anthony and Glenn and that Be Nice episode as well as the others. And the GMs you were talking about, uh, Tomas Carrera, so the uh, Four Seasons in New York downtown, and Jay Grady Collin of the Garden City Hotel in Long Island, which we're uh, doing a lot of taping at right now. They're generous enough to uh, give us a space um, every once in a while to uh, record. All right, any other questions that we have over here? Let me come back over here. If you're not listening, we're doing a podcast called Checking In with Anthony and Glenn. You can find it really anywhere you can find a podcast. And it's been really exciting because we, we, we talk about anything we want, and it, it, it's, it's pretty fun. Great. Steve? Great. So what elements of technology do you like, and what elements of technology that are being adopted you know, in the industry do you not like? Well, I like Thank you. I hate kiosks, and I like things that facilitate. Yes. I, like peop- I like things that facilitate me to check in. I was just talking to somebody, and they went to a hotel, and um, he, I said, listen, people want to meet people at the front desk. They want to get that feeling. He goes, no, no, no. I, oh, the Yotel. I just checked in at the Yotel, and I saw that robot you know, handling the luggage. And the, I went to this little kiosk at the, at the bottom of the, uh, at the elevator, and it got me my room. I got my room. I was happy. But 99% of the time, that doesn't work in most hotels. I haven't seen anybody really does it well. So I just think that... Like, I, to me, I think the next wave, and I think you're seeing it more and more in technology, is text messaging, right? Voicemails are dead, okay? I, don't, I, I barely listen to my voicemails. My kids, who, I have twins that are 19, my, my, my youngest is 16, they don't listen to voicemail. They haven't set up voicemail on their iPhone. They don't know what that yeah, is. Yeah, same thing with my kids, Anthony. They have no concept right. about that whatsoever. They have no idea what it is. But you text me? I want everything. Everybody knows me. That, you know, no matter where I am, if you text me, you get an answer. You email me, maybe three days, and if you call me, maybe never. Right. We're, okay. seeing, we're seeing great products now that do the text messaging, but what do you think about voice-activated rooms? In reference to, like... Yeah, you know, I'm like, a guest, and it's like, uh, you know, hello, Google, or, you know, hey, Alexa, I need some more towels, I need yeah, whatever. Yeah, I, I have Alexa. I was given it. I, I sit on the board of directors of my college, uh, Park University, and I was given it as a gift, and I unplug it all the time. I don't use it. Um, and again, I'm not one of those old funny, oh, I, you know, I'm afraid people, you know, the, the dark state's coming after me. No, I just, like, if they can hear my voice say Alexa, they can hear my voice say something else. So I just unplug it. So for me, I don't know. It might be the next wave. I think, I think people have got to use it. In their, how many people here use Alexa in their home? Okay. Uh, that's not many right. people. So, I would have thought so, it was a lot more. So based on this little kind of survey... I don't think it'll work in hotels because if only one person's using it in a home, you're not going to use it in a hotel because you're not using it in your home. We use text messaging. So if a hotel texts us that the confirmation number, the hotel texts us about room service, we're going to respond to that because we're all you know, obsessed with it. But if one person out of 30 people use Alexa in their home, it's not going to work in the hotel business. Well, that's an interesting point that you, uh, you make right there because right now so many of the major hotel companies are putting a lot of emphasis behind that because they think it's going to be the next big thing. Right. And you know what? It might work in some hotels. It might not. I'm not an expert. I just did a random sample. I've asked other people. So if I irritate anybody selling lecture in hotels, I apologize. Well, that was going to be my next big business. Thanks for uh, ruining that for me. I guess I'll just have to stick co-hosting a show with you. It's ever been invented. And, and listen, I will eventually use Alexa in my house. I'm just not ready. Right. All right. I think we got time for one more question. All right. Yes, sir. What is the one skill that you use or that you think makes you the most effective leader? That's so, a great question. Yeah, that's a good one. I what, didn't hear it. One skill that makes you the most effective leader? Something I'm really bad at. You know, when I was born, God gave me these big ears to listen. For 50 years, I didn't use them, okay? Listening. But not listening to just get to your next subject. I'm actually learning when I'm talking on our podcast. I'm really listening to Glenn, whereas maybe five years ago, I was just listening to get my point across and wait for him to shut up. Now I'm listening. He's still, still waiting. Listening with the intent to really understand. And I think a general manager, when they're seeing a housekeeper or if you're in a different segment, you're in the car business, when you're listening to that line employee, are you listening just to make yourself look good and like you're paying attention? Or are you truly listening and paying attention? And it's, been a, it's taken me a long time 
to truly learn how to listen. Uh, we, and again, one of the things we talked about, I was out in Vietnam shooting a show with my um, cameraman, John Kellerman. The Extreme Hotel Show? Yeah, the Extreme Hotel Show. And John Kellerman is a real nomad. He's traveled everywhere. And everywhere he goes, he embraces people and their culture. When I went to Vietnam, I was like, I asked questions, and I thought it was cool, but I was like, I was just asking questions so I can have cool stories to tell. He was asking questions or, and, and really living the culture because he appreciated and was humbled by that culture. And so he really taught me a lesson without him ever t having to tell me that. I just watched him. So I think if you're a leader, whether you're mid-level, whether you're a supervisor, or whether you're an executive like Jay, listen with the intent to learn. Don't listen with the intent to get to the next subject. And it's taken me 50 years to figure that out. Excellent. Wow. This has been a lot of fun. What do you guys think? Yeah. Do you have a question? Uh, uh, you all right. All right. By popular demand, one more question. Kevin Abernathy. Hey, Anthony. Hello, Kevin. Um, so through all the seasons of Hotel Impossible, and I know you're the type of person that once you're done with the place, you, you, tend to, you move on. You go on to the next thing. But looking back, is there one episode where if you had a mulligan and you could do it over again, is there one episode where you would go back? No. No. Okay. Thank you. And, 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 yeah. I, and I'll tell you why. That's a, that is an excellent question. I'll tell you why. Because when I go, I leave it on the field. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I don't talk to my kids or my wife outside of 11 o'clock at night. I don't take meetings. I don't do conference calls. I'm there for four days. I've never met you. I don't know anything about your hotel. It's a real show. It's 100% real. Anybody can ever come to the set. It's 100% real. I don't, does that mean you're done? Because you just stand. No, I'm trying to focus even more. <laughs> so um, I bleed on those shows. And I want to, because you're inviting me into your home. You're inviting me into your hotel. You're financially maybe crippled. And your, your kid's college fund and your car payment, your mortgage relies on us turning around this hotel. I have to give you my tire focus. So when I get on that plane, I'm done. And if you don't listen to me, or if you didn't pay attention when I was there, I did my job and I did it to the best of my ability. But if I, like the first season when I would bring it home with me, I was just not a good person to be around. I was just always like kind of miserable because maybe people weren't listening to me. But no, I, when I'm done, I'm done because I know I did everything I could. Beautiful, I love it. Now, one of the cool things that we do on every single one of our episodes is we try to find out something about each other, a little bit different, maybe a little bit personal, maybe something a little whimsical. Anthony, tell me something about you that I don't know. I am going to Rome on Saturday to do a speaking engagement, and then I'm going to um, Albania for the first time to do some consulting. And I've never been to Albania, so I'm really excited and, and a little bit nervous because um, I've never been there before. So um, that's something you may not know. Excellent. I, I love uh, it. So, so Glenn, um, well, what's that question I want to ask you? What's something I don't know about you? I thought this whole thing was going to be entirely fucked up, but it went great. So <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I think it's awesome. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. wait, why did you think it was going to be fucked up? Because I'm insecure. <laughs> what I spent my whole life trying to, why do you think I'm so loud all the time? Because I'm a scared little child inside. Yeah, I'm learning that about you. Yes, I know. <laughs> all right, so we're, we're, we're poking holes in, uh, in the veneer that questions? I've been trying to create for decades. Any other questions, anyone? One more? I, no, it, we're good? It, it, all right, I think we're good. I think these people need to drink some more. Anthony, how can you find us online? You can find us, you can find me at Anthony Hotels, uh, anywhere on social media, and you can find... You. you can find me at Traveling Glenn, and I would love for everyone listening, for those in the room, if you want to get my Sunday night newsletter for NoVacancyNews.com, which includes all of the episodes of Checking In with Anthony and Glenn, text the word, word HOTEL to 66866. That's the word HOTEL to 66866. Check out NoVacancyNews.com, the No Vacancy Podcast, the Hotel Tech Podcast, the Hotel Design Podcast, and of course, our show, Checking In with Anthony and Glenn. Let's hear it for Anthony. Thank you so much. It's been a, a lot of time. And thanks to all of you for checking in. See you next time. Awesome. That was good, buddy. Was great. Thanks, everyone. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn. Teaching you to be the hotel you're that you want to be. It's checking in with Anthony and Glenn.